Welcome to How Do You Soccer? I'm your host, Kirsten Hayes, and today we have our guest, Cesar Javaharian, who is co-founder and chief medical officer of Direct Urgent Care, and he's here to talk with us about concussions, and uh, especially with respect to youth soccer, but, but also in general. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So do you want to um, tell us a little bit about um, uh, why you're looking into uh, specializing in, in uh, uh, concussions, wh how you got into that, and then a little bit about what are concussions. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, so I'm Cesar Javaharian, a co-founder of Direct Urgent Care. I'm also an emergency medicine physician, so I've had many years of taking care of head injured patients and uh, um, also soccer dad. So I've been to many games where kids on our team or on the opponent's team um, uh, sustain head injuries. Uh, and I realized that uh, most communities needed resources to uh, be able to evaluate those head injuries to see whether kids had concussion or not. The more research I did, the more I realized that, that our clinic should really provide that service. Uh, one of the kind of hallmark moments in, in my career was watching my daughter's teammate uh, get hit with a head in a, during a soccer game. And, uh, and actually she came into our clinic and we had a hard time diagnosing whether or not she had a true concussion. Uh, and that prompted me to become certified in concussion management and uh, start our concussion program. Okay. Um, and and so what uh, I looked up on so so you guys run the impact test we do yeah um, and I looked up uh, where are their providers and it looks like there aren't very many around um, so what what um, qualifications do you have to have and and um, how does it what's the process yeah, there's actually an extensive uh, training program to become a concussion certified um, uh, clinician which I've gone through and uh, uh, which our team um, has actually adopted. And it really takes us through uh, where the area where medical school and, and training um, really didn't, didn't touch on. So um, in emergency medicine and frankly in primary care, there's very little discussion about what concussion is. Um, and there's very little discussion about when to release kids uh, uh, or even adults um, that have sustained head injury um, to be able to go back to sports and go back to activity. Um, so luckily we were able to, to both use primary research sources, uh, meta-analyses in the literature, as well as commercial applications like IMPACT to help create protocols uh, that uh, get kids back to playing sports when they're safe to do so. So is that a protocol that, that, that you guys have developed, that Direct Urgent Care has developed? It is, actually. It's a protocol that we've developed, uh, and we use impact as a tool in that assessment. So you can imagine a scenario where um, a child either wants to go back to um, activity sooner than they're ready to. Uh, potentially, there's um, some sort of peer pressure. Uh, coaches want them back and they can actually hide their symptoms. Uh, we use impact as a way to uncover those symptoms uh, that would otherwise be missed uh, if we just go on the history alone. So we use it as a tool in addition to uh, the, the other history components, how bad the injury was, uh, how many times they've had concussion, what underlying medical conditions the person has to make a recommendation about uh, return to play activities uh, so we have a graded uh, protocol um, that takes you from no activity whatsoever, including no school, uh, back to full um, you know, contact sports. Um, and we noticed that this is particularly helpful um, you know, in soccer, football, hockey, uh, basketball as the primary kind of um, concussion-related sports. As opposed yeah. to just playing around in the yard or something? Is yeah, it? <laughs> or baseball, oh, you know, okay. so low frequency for, for concussion. Yeah, <laughs> so. okay. 
And uh, I know sometimes uh, players have video from uh, the play in which they were hurt. Does it, is that helpful at all? Actually, it's really helpful. Oh, interesting. Um, so, so concussion is defined. It, it's actually a minor traumatic brain injury, um, and and knowing the mechanism precisely is helpful to see. Uh, so, so was there a severe deceleration? So, when uh, when a player, for example, hits the ground. They've, uh, they've gone from a very rapid movement to a complete stop. And uh, the impact of that is much, you know, much worse than if, uh, for example, if there's a collision shoulder to shoulder. Um, now I have to, the, the caveat to that is that every player is a little bit different. And we don't understand in, in, in the scientific community, we don't understand why uh, that certain kids are more prone to concussion even with the same stimulus um, as compared to other kids. So, um, so for the clinician to do a proper assessment, the more information we have, the better. Um, and basically with kids, it's best to actually err on the side of being safe. So if there is any concern for concussion, we generally would ask that the coaches do a you know sideline assessment and remove the, the the player from activity for that day, and then either bring it to the you know bring the player to our clinic for an assessment, uh, compare it to a baseline test if they have one with us, and uh, we can make a more informed decision about you know, how bad their concussion is or uh, whether even there was a concussion. So. Um, so, you know, for the for parents and for coaches, I think erring on the side of, of caution is always best in these scenarios. And the sideline evaluation is that the impact sideline evaluation, or do you, is there something else yeah, that you have? Uh, impact does have a, um, an example or a type of sideline evaluation. There are also uh, fairly brief ones that that uh, coaches can use. And we're happy to provide that as a resource for the MVLA uh, team okay. or the uh, league. So. Okay. Or, or anyone else. <laughs> or anyone yeah. else. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. The more, I think, the more informed parents and coaches are, the better. Um, concussion uh, is not a joke, unfortunately. We know, uh, actually, we have friends whose kids have been, um, who've had recurrent concussions and have had to stop playing sports who have experienced mood changes, whose grades have, have declined uh, because of repeated head injuries. Um, it's an area where even as an emergency room physician, I wasn't as informed about as I should have been. And that's after working in a trauma center for 10 years. Hmm. So um, absolutely, it's something that, that we should you know, spread the word on. Okay. One thing yeah. you mentioned is a player hitting shoulder to shoulder, and then that that might cause a concussion. It, How does that work? Yeah, so so really any kind of um, change in direction of the head <laughs> uh, can cause a coup and contra coup, minor injury to the brain. What and so you can think of oh, uh, so <laughs> coup injury is uh, the side of impact is considered the coup. So if you get hit from this side, that's the coup, and. Okay. And there could be an injury on the other side called a contra coup. Because the brain's moving back because and Because the brain, exactly. The brain is kind of in this liquid environment connected with blood vessels, and it can... Does it you know, get bruised? Or? And, and essentially, that's what we think yeah. is happening okay. in, in the case of concussion. So, so there's um, small bruising to the neurons, and frankly, uh, there's shearing of the axon of the neuron. And the axon is actually uh, where the cell, the neuron, talks to other neurons. And there are these long axons in the brain that get sheared hmm. during concussion. And in severe cases uh, where there lo there's lots of shearing, um, the brain can become swollen and the patient can become unconscious. Um, and then in, obviously in very severe cases, usually with car accidents, um, or falls from from you know height, um, you know the brain becomes so badly injured and swollen that death would result from it. So, uh, so concussion is when that happens to in a in a much more minor uh, level than um, 
you know, than in the other types of injuries uh, with car accidents and things. Okay. So, uh, when watching soccer on TV, we see in instances of players hitting their heads against each other, falling to the ground and hitting their head, you know, just coming up and holding their head, and then the ref looks at them and the trainer looks at them, and then they're back in the game. Uh, what? I mean, what are the probabilities that that they actually did have a concussion? You know, what what do you think should be happening? Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, maybe you can't judge because, as you said, everyone's different. So, unlike things like blood pressure, there's uh, very little objective information about concussion that can be quickly ascertained uh, on the sideline, and a lot of it comes down to judgment as well as the mechanism of injury. So if, uh, if a player gets hit really hard and says to you, I'm absolutely fine, uh, the coach may still choose to take that player out of the game. Um, clearly, if the, if the player has headache, confusion, amnesia, so doesn't remember what happened to them, those are hallmark signs of, of concussion and they don't necessarily appear right away. So those symptoms may take minutes to hours to manifest. And it's one reason why perhaps in professional sports the coaches are more likely to send them back in. But definitely when with the youth players, we would recommend at least taking, at least being cautious and allowing the child to see how they feel over minutes to hours and uh, and then assessing whether or not they should be able to go back. Um, I think in, yeah, you know, I've, uh, again, I'm a parent myself with kids playing soccer. I've dealt with it with two of my three kids who are in, um, who are in, uh, you know, travel team soccer. And it's hard. Uh, I think it's hard for coaches. It's hard for, for parents to know, you know, they got hit in the head, but they seem to be okay. Maybe they should go back in. I think. If, if the mechanism isn't so bad, that might be okay. Um, if mechanism they got, meaning how they got hit. Yeah, right? how badly the, the head kind of moved, how badly it snapped. Mm -hmm. what, what we're really worried about is the long-term effect of repeated concussions. And we know that an initial minor concussion may have very little long-term impact, if any. Um, but during the uh, week to four week period of time, um, that minor concussion, if, if the brain hasn't fully healed, it's susceptible to, to getting injured much worse. And part of the theory behind that is that the small amount of swelling as those axons shear, when it hasn't resolved, the brain is prone to a second injury. And that second injury can cause you know, much worse uh, outcomes. So that's what we're really trying to avoid, is not necessarily making a judgment about the initial impact, but was the initial impact enough to make your player susceptible to a second impact um, and uh, you know, trying to avoid that. So. so what's the risk if, if a player has, uh, you know, got hit in the head or, did, or had something that caused the brain to move around yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and they don't have symptoms for, you know, a few ten minutes or whatever while they're being checked out, they go back in the game, what's the risk then? It's really hard to say, and again, um, it could be zero risk. Mm -hmm. So it could be that they truly didn't have any kind of um, brain injury or, or minor concussion in that scenario. And going back into the game is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, and unfortunately, there's, there's no great way of knowing uh, when that's the case or when after they go back into the, the game and they finish it, then they go home and they're really irritable or they have a hard time sleeping, or um, they're crying for maybe no apparent reason. Uh, those are actually concussion symptoms, where they feel a little foggy. You know, those are the things that we hear kids saying when they come in uh, for evaluation in our clinics. Um, so, so it's a bit of a judgment call on the parents and the, and the coaches, where are you willing to risk that with your player uh, if, if they got hit fairly hard, but they really don't have any symptoms, um, you know, are you willing to risk having them go back and play with a minor concussion that ends up manifesting later on or not? Um, 
we're kind of in the infancy of understanding concussion in the scientific literature. So, you know, unfortunately, there, there just aren't great ways of measuring that. Uh, clearly, in the cases where the player has positive symptoms, so, yeah, my head hurts, or I don't know what date today is, um, I can't remember my brother's name. Uh, those are instances where the player absolutely cannot go back to playing um, until they're cleared. Um, but I, I agree, the more common scenario is where they're now not symptomatic, they want to go back and play, and the coach doesn't really know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a tough one. I've, again, I've been there my, myself, yeah. and I'm, you know, I'm trained in this. I actually experienced this with my seven-year-old uh, not, not more than a week ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so my wife and I kind of kicked it around quite a bit and ended up you know, being cautious and keeping him out of, out of sports. So, um, but it's hard. Yeah. Um, are there any other symptoms that you want to talk about to help parents sort of evaluate uh, whether they think they might see something? Well, I think, so I, I mentioned a few, in, including yeah. uh, sleep changes, mood changes, uh, uh, fogginess or balance abnormalities. The most common one is headache. It's present in 75 to 80 percent of um, kids who have concussion. Uh, but not 100%. So, so by saying, you know, my player doesn't even have a headache, they must be fine. If you're seeing other signs or symptoms of it, um, um, they still could have a concussion. Mm -hmm. So don't base your judgment only on headache as the, as the main symptom. Um, you know, there are other criteria for adults um, where headache is less prominent. Um, and so, but in the case of kids, uh, I would say the, the mood changes are, are the ones that are most surprising and, and harder to pick up on. Yeah, whether so. they're tired or whether, yeah. yeah. And it's hard to say, are they yeah. hungry after the yeah. game? And part of it is, you know, they're fed, everything seems to be okay, they won the game, but they're, you know, yelling at you or crying about something that you can't even explain, so. Yeah. Process of elimination. Yeah, yeah, potentially. Okay. So, and obviously, always coming in um, either uh, to their primary doctors or if it's you know if it's a time when you'd like to bring them into our clinics, we'll be happy to do those analyses um, and provide a professional opinion on on what should be done. Okay. Um, um, and uh, w what can be done to help? Uh, prevent them? Can you build up your neck muscles? Can you wear uh, head gear? Can you, what, is there anything you can do? So that's a great, great question. So uh, actually our soccer league looked into um, uh, obtaining head gear um, for our players. Uh, unfortunately the evidence isn't conclusive to say that you know, the head gear makes a huge difference or not. Uh, similarly, you know, for football players wearing helmets, they're still just as prone to concussion, hmm. um, you know, as soccer players without helmets. Uh, in fact, they're more prone because, again, it's the uh, deceleration of, uh, or acceleration of the head and the brain within that, the skull, that determines concussion. So having a little bit of padding around your head doesn't necessarily protect you. I think the, the idea of strengthening neck, neck muscles is a good one. Uh, again, if you have strong, um, you know, strong neck muscles, you might be able to counteract the forces that are moving the skull. Um, so that that might be helpful. Hasn't been systematically reviewed though, or, or studied in, in any of the studies that I've read. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see any harm in working on that in practice. You know, as as they develop other muscles. Um, so. Yeah. So other than that, there's. Nothing that, yeah, okay. yeah unfortunately, nothing. I, you know, even the NFL is, is trying to figure out, well, how do we prevent concussion? Essentially, their entire you know, league is on yeah. the line, so high stakes for them. Yeah. But, huh. yeah. So are there any other sort of basics of concussions that you want to describe? Yeah. We've gotten to some of it. Yeah, I mean, um, I, th I think the, you know, the, the biggest point for, for parents to really be aware of is um, when in doubt you can sit your kids out 
um, and that's that's probably hard to to swallow, <laughs> uh, especially when kids want to stay in. Um, but the long-term consequences are are too great to risk it, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. Different parents or coaches might have a, a you know their own opinions about it, um, but we've just seen too many um, instances where players not only have a bad outcome from this event, but potentially are out from the sport for months and months afterward because they have a second head injury uh, that really does damage. Yeah. And we know from uh, the studies with the football players that long-term repeated head injury um, can cause you know, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Uh, we see that in boxers as well. That's what CTE is. And that's what CTE is, yeah. yeah. And that's where you know the movie that was recently out <laughs> discussed. So, so the whole idea is how do we reduce that from the possibility of that from developing in our own okay. family members? So uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, again, changes people's personalities. In severe cases, you see these football players who the family swears and they're nice people and now they're acting badly. Um, we, you know, we, we also see higher rates of depression in that community. Uh, we see chronic pain as a, as a long-term effect of recurrent concussion. Um, so, so to me, it's, it's best to be safe. The, the other kind of important thing that I didn't realize is, again, um, the same stimuli uh, or stimulus can, can have a dramatically different outcome in, uh, depending on who the player is. So some kids are predisposed to, to um, developing concussion. And so it might be a small shoulder hit and they develop bad headaches and dizziness, um, whereas you know, other players get hit fairly hard in the head. And even with observation, a day or two afterwards, they're, they're doing fine. Hmm. Um, and, and we don't understand why. There's some, um, some studies that suggest that there's an underlying genetic mechanism and a certain protein has been identified as making pa uh, patients more likely to have concussive sy symptoms. So, uh, so okay. that's an interesting wow. thing for yeah. parents to understand. And yeah. uh, like, even though it was a minor hit and your child is actually complaining about headaches and things, don't, don't think that it may not be related to concussion. Yeah, so. okay. Um, we got some questions to come in, so I'd like oh, to read some questions to you and get your responses. Um, so one is, uh, my neighbor had two kids suffer concussions on the same day. One went to a primary care pediatrician and the other to the MDs affiliated with the Earthquake Soccer Association. They handled the recovery very differently with one recommending more rest, darkness, time off school, etc., and the other wanting the athlete to start to acclimate quicker. Is the treatment and recovery very different by new knowledge we have about concussions or more related to the athlete's symptoms and tolerance to progress back to doing the everyday activities? That's such a wonderful question to ask and, and so sorry to hear about two kids having you know, head injuries on the same day. Um, the bottom line is that, that the approach of a gradual return to play um, following that protocol to a T is the right answer. Um, and uh, one provider having a different approach, um, I would want to question why that approach was taken um, and uh, whether that provider had a baseline concussion test to compare with the uh, post-head injury uh, evaluation or test. I think that um, uh, well, it just makes me wonder whether there's a lack of knowledge around head injury and concussion that would, um, that would make a provider advocate a, a quicker return to play. Um, I know, again, in, in, in my training, and you know, um, feel, you know, went to great schools, uh, trained in fantastic hospitals, but we actually didn't learn uh, very much about head injury and concussion and return to activity. Um, and I, I have a suspicion that that's generally the case in the, in the medical community. This is really something that came to light in the past five years. Um, uh, I think the first kind of neurologic association consensus statement on concussion was in 1997, which in mm -hmm. the you know, medical community, that's fairly recent knowledge. 
and it does take a long time for that information to get uh, to dissipate into the community. So uh, absolutely, there's a six-step protocol uh, to um, uh, to get players to return uh, to play. There's some thought that in uh, patients who have post-concussive syndrome, and that's defined as three or more uh, concussion symptoms lasting for three or more weeks. So in the case of post-concussive syndrome, um, in those scenarios, uh, going back to light activity, and that's defined as 10 or 15 minutes of very light activity, like perhaps even a light jog or reading, um, that, uh, that that would improve outcomes. Mm -hmm. Still inconclusive in the scientific literature, but, but there is some evidence to support it. The other, I think, uh, important point that I forgot to make earlier is that you know, in addition to, to sleep uh, uh, disturbances, um, we, we really want patients who have uh, concussion to have cognitive rest as well as um, physical rest. So that means no screens, so that's no iPad, no iPhone, no computer, um, dark room, quiet, um, not hanging out with friends or talking too much as part of the recovery process. And that's, that's really hard to do when your seven-year-old is bouncing off the walls yes. in general, <laughs> but complaining of headache. But it's an important point that I wanted to make, and I'd forgotten to make that earlier, so. Oh, good, oh, good. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have just less than a minute left. Um, oh, so one question is, does cognitive testing in the short term correlate strongly with cognitive performance in the long term? In other words, can we extrapolate with the results from short-term surveys on cognition after head injury with long-term long cognition as adults? So these are only observational studies um, that are available. Um, short answer is we don't know. Um, this hasn't been studied in a systematic fashion. We do know that there's cognitive decline in boxers and pro football players over time. And the theory is that that's from repetitive head injuries. So, okay. so we don't know if it will correlate at this point, but, but if you know, patients get back to normal cognition, the thought is that they're probably OK if they don't have a second injury. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's thank very, you so been much. very yeah. helpful, a lot of insights that we didn't know about. So um, thank you for tuning in to How Do You Soccer? And thank you, Caesar, Dr. Thank you Caesar so Javaharian, for joining us thank you. from Direct Urgent Care. And tune in next time to another episode of How Do You Soccer? <laughs>